God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory.
taking a, a week off from the Song of Solomon, and we actually have a special guest who will be sharing with us how different forms of salt were used throughout the Bible and why Jesus called us, why he called his people the salts of the earth. Now, Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, and he goes on to say that not only are you the salt of the earth, that you are the lights of the world. And it sounds like, I mean, that's a lot of responsibility that he's given to us, but he calls us to reflect his light into the darkness of this world. I love what Jesus says in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So let's sing together this morning of our King, the one who humbled himself, the one who brought his light into this world. So highly exalted, glorious 
together. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I love that with one voice we all can sing just how amazing, how good, how wonderful you are to us. Father, I pray that as we we study your word together, as we look at what it's like to be, what it means to be the light of the world, what it means to be the salt of the earth, Father, continue to encourage us to be the hope that we shine into this broken world. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, our guest speaker today is a popular speaker at national conferences and churches and an author of multiple books and Bible studies. Can we please give a warm horizon welcome to Margaret Feinberg. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, worship team. That was awesome. That was awesome. Guys, I am so excited to be back at Horizon. I've missed you guys. It is a joy and a delight. Well, as it was kind of hinted at, uh, I have been spending the last 15 years going on a culinary pilgrimage through the Bible. Is anybody here a fan of the Food Network? Rachel Ray, Bobby Flay, Chick-fil-A. Well, once I started to look for food in the Bible, I began to discover that it pops and sizzles on almost every page. With so many mentions of food in the Bible, I had to narrow my search. And so as I began to do deep dives on particular foods, the culinary pilgrimage took me to Napa Valley to pick grapes, to Oregon to spend time with a shepherdess, to go to Colorado to spend time with a beekeeper, to pluck figs in Madera, California. The journey even took me to go fish on the Galilee and bring in an olive harvest in Croatia with a family who had taken care of those trees for generations. And with each of these individuals, I would open up the Bible and I would ask, how do you read this passage, not as a theologian, but in light of what you do every day? And their answers changed the way that I read the Bible forever. 
Time and time again, I found myself asking, how have I grown up in the church? How have I studied the scripture? How have I listened to so many sermons and podcasts and nobody has told me these things? These journeys became the foundation for two books and Bible studies, one called Taste and See, and the other called Scouting the Divine, my search for God in wine, wool, and wild honey, because who needs some alliteration? But as I began diving in, the scripture just kept opening up, and the food, or rather the accessory to food that we are going to look at is one that is near and dear to my heart today, and that is salt. You see, without salt, I might not exist. My Jewish father began manufacturing surfboards in the 1960s, back the very first time that longboards were cool. He eventually built up his manufacturing company to be one of the largest on the East Coast. And in those earlier days, he would drive down the coast and pop into surf shops. And one particular day around Cocoa Beach, Florida, he popped into a surf shop and he noticed a woman who caught his eye. He felt a little awkward and weird, but he just used the surfboards to open up a conversation. And he really, he wanted to invite her to dinner, but he didn't know how. And so he just said, hey, you know, if you're willing to go to dinner with me tonight, I will give you a discount on any surfboard that you want. So she says yes, and they go out to dinner. And as one of the first courses, this woman orders a bowl of soup. And she loved salt, and so she just started salting her soup. And she was in the middle of telling a story. And she is salting, and she is salting. And my dad's eyes are growing wider and wider. And do I interrupt? What do I do when suddenly the lid of the salt shaker pops off, splashes in the soup, salt and soup go all over the table and the woman is thinking there is no way I'm going to get a second date. But something about her continued to intrigue him. And so this is a photo of my mom and dad on their 50th wedding anniversary. And to this day they keep telling that endearing story in the moment when my dad decided he really liked my mom, even in the midst of what looked like it was falling apart. And so without salt, I would not exist. But neither would many or all of you. You see, salt is found in our sweat and our saliva and our tears. Salt is essential physiologically for our nerves to transmit nerve impulses. It's also necessary to stimulate muscles. Without salt, if all of it was drained from your body, your heart would cease to beat. It is a source of life. Now, we live in an age where salt is just so common and accessible and inexpensive. We don't give it a second thought. I mean, guys, if you went to Skyline and you said, um, could I get some salt? And they responded, there will be an upcharge for that. You would think, what is going on here? And yet that has not been the case for most of human history. In fact, it was the Egyptians who were among the first to discover the power and the potential of salt. They began harvesting it from the Nile Delta. And what they discovered is if they took a fish or a piece of meat, an incredibly valuable food source, and they were to make small cuts in it, and they were to layer it with salt, then suddenly that food that once went bad in 24 or 48 hours could now last 24 or 48 months. And in the process, the cooking technique of curing was born. But it wasn't just the Egyptians, it was also the Romans who ruled during the time of Jesus Christ. The Romans were so in love with salt, they actually built a salt road into the center of their empire. But why? It's actually because the Roman Empire was one that was constantly expanding through military force. And what they discovered is that when they put soldiers on the battlefield, and thank you to anyone here who has served in the military for your service. When their soldiers went on the battlefield, that they would sweat profusely. And that if salt was not renewed within their bodies, what would happen is they would experience confusion, seizures, and even permanent brain damage. 
And so the Romans began including salt in the soldier's pay. Now in Latin, the root for salt is actually the word sal. And so that's where we get the word salary from. It's also etymologically where we get the word salad from, which simply means vegetables seasoned with salt, or the word sausage, which actually means meat seasoned with salt. Now, for you history buffs in the room, and I love you, salt played a crucial role in multiple wars. Napoleon, for instance, he had thousands of troops die on the battlefield because without access to salt, their wounds would not heal. And for those of you who are Civil War buffs, there was one particular town in Virginia in which the Union Army was committed to fight for no matter what. Its name? Saltville. Because they knew that if they lost access to that salt for their troops, that they could lose everything. And so I think it's a bit of this historical background which helps shed new light on one of Jesus' teachings. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13, we're set up that Jesus is out and he is traveling and he is teaching the people. And in Matthew 5, he gives the Sermon on the Mount. A slightly different version is given in the Gospel of Luke in the Sermon on the Plain. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus says this. He says, you, 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 you are the salt of the earth. And I'm kind of like a little bit of a Dora the Explorer, like spiritually. And so I'm somebody who is not content to just read the scripture. I want to taste and I want to smell and I want to touch. I want to experience the fullness of what is there. And so I traveled about 150 miles south of our home in Utah to a place called Redmond, Utah. And I got to enter into an ancient seabed that was frozen in time in the form of the Redmond salt mine. When I arrived, I was greeted by a 50-something man named Neil who was so kind and jovial, he literally would give Fred Rogers a run for his money. And after a short conversation, he invited me to go into the mine. Of course, I jumped at the opportunity, and he handed me a hard hat. We climbed into the truck. We began driving toward the back of the property. And suddenly, this kind of black cave, we drove in, and it just swallowed us whole. And from the truck lights, I could see the salt stalactites dripping down from the ceiling. We began to descend, making decisions between right and left turns. And at one point, Neil looks at me and he goes, you have to remember this, because if something were to collapse or happen, you've got to get your way back out. And I was like, ooh, directionally challenged. This could be a problem. But we eventually arrived 410 feet down into that salt mine. There was a huge piece of equipment in front of us, and Neil flashed the truck lights twice, and the machinery stopped. We opened the door, and I began to climb out of the truck, and I breathed in, and it smelled like the sweetness of the ocean. I looked, and there was salt not just in every direction, but beneath my feet. And as I'm looking down, I'm realizing that it is actually snowing salt particles. And I reach down, and I just scoop up just two handfuls of the salt. And I'm kind of like the girl who loves the free samples at Costco and Sam's Club and everywhere. And so I was like, ooh, I gotta try this. And so I tried the salt and it was different than salt that I'd eaten before. It was like, it had a more multi-dimensional flavor and it had almost a sweetish finish at the end of the flavor profile. Well, Neil waves me over to the side of the cave and, and we look and, and all of a sudden he takes his hand and he brushes it against the wall that is there of the salt. And, and all these fine salt particles like dust just wipe away. And what is left there is the most mesmerizing, beautiful encounter. It, it is like peach garnets. It is like it is like this quartz that is tan and white. It looks like just incredible jewels in the light of the trucks. And, and as I'm watching it, I'm just in awe of our creator God who would create such hidden beauty, not just in the stars and the space above, but in the very crevices of the earth and inside of each one of us. 
Well, Neil warns me, honey, we can't shut down the salt mine very long. And so we climb back into the truck and we begin driving back out. And as we reach the surface, we return to where I met him and we spend the afternoon talking about salt, researching in the Bible, talking about different passages. And I began to understand salt in a whole new way. You see, he was kind enough before I left to say, hey, do you want a piece of the salt from our mine to go home with? And I was like, yes. Does anybody want to see what that looked like? Anybody? So this is a piece of the salt from the Redmond salt mine. And I don't know if you can see in this light, but the reddish portions are actually from the iron. The darker brown portions are from the magnesium. And there are over 60 minerals in here that are helpful and healthy to our bodies. And when he showed me this and I began to do more biblically, biblical research, I began to start to see salt in a whole new way. Because first of all, when you look at the salt, one of the things you will notice is that there are just darker areas in it next to the white. And Neil said that first of all, it is the chefs who prefer the darker areas because those areas that are more mineral intense will bring out the high, low and the high flavor profiles in the food that they're cooking. But I also began to realize that when Jesus said that you are the salt of the earth, he was never talking about the chemically altered, highly refined, fortified with iodine for goiters since 1924 kind of salt that graces most of our tables. Rather, when Jesus, Jesus was saying this, he was saying that you are the salt of the earth, that you are sourced or harvested from where he has placed you. And in Israel, everybody knew that the salt either came from the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea, or the salt mines within Israel. And so when God calls you and says, you are the salt of the earth, in essence what he's saying is you are hewn, you are brought forth from your particular geography, from your particular upbringing, from your particular culture. That he has seen you and he has brought you forth with a unique personality, with strengths, with weaknesses, with quirks, and he wants to use all of it as he pours you out as the salt of the earth. And so I think that when we look at Jesus' declaration that we are salt, we need to consider this historical and cultural background and the ears and eyes with those who heard Jesus say these words. And so I think when Jesus was saying this, those in that culture would have recognized that what Jesus was saying was, as the salt of the earth, you are a preserving agent. That you are one that just like the Egyptians when they cut that meat and they place the little bit of salt on each layer in order to preserve it in a time of no refrigeration, that Jesus has also embedded you in this culture, in this place, in this slice of history. Make no mistake, it is not an accident that you are part of this community, this church, where you attend here, now, today. You are called to be preserving agents to preserve what? The ways, the life, and the teaching of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. But it's not just that they heard that message that we are sold and understood that we were preserving agents. They knew in that time what we know today, and that is that salt is a flavoring agent. And so Jesus was saying, you are a flavoring agent. That everywhere you go, you are called to bring the flavor of heaven down here to earth. That where there is bitterness, you bring forgiveness. That where there is sourness, that you bring sweetness. That what they taste everywhere you go is the goodness of God. I had a friend this past weekend who shared a story with me about her son-in-law. Early in the spring, he was so excited to get out on their boat on the lake that he 
course, brought his three kids. He invited a ton of friends, maybe too many, to climb into the boat and enjoy a day on the lake. And they headed off, and and it felt full. Like, the boat felt full, but it it was because there were just so many people, he thought. And and so he cruises to the far end of the lake, and in his head, he's just thinking, man, something is not quite right. And and so he kind of looks around, and he begins to look, and he says, oh, my goodness, this boat is filling with water. And he realizes that he has left the plug back on the dock. And so he goes, what do we do? Like, we we got to figure this out. We got to get back. And and so he just guns it as fast as he can. And they're moving pretty slow. And they're still taking on water with all the weight. And he's starting to get toward the area where the dock is. And all of a sudden, he has to cross through a large no-wake zone. But, but he's got to keep going as fast as he can back. And all of a sudden, people start yelling at him, slow down, you're going too fast. Some of the people are using obscenities. Other people are giving him the bird, and it wasn't a pet parakeet. And so he's just going, ah. And all of a sudden, one particular person on one boat yells out, do you need help? And the guy shakes his head, yes. How can we help? And that boat came alongside this man and all those people and allowed them to deboard. And so the boat became lighter and he could make it safely to the shore. And I think the question for us is simply how are we living in the slice of history and the moment that God has placed us? Are we the people who are seeing somebody who's causing wakes, who's different than us, who who may be doing something strange that we don't understand, and are we yelling at them, sometimes with unkind words or obscenities? Or are we the people who is looking for every opportunity to reach out and say, do you need help? How can we help? Because as children of God, we are the people who are intended to bring the message of salvation to help people get to where they need to go next in life in safety and arrive with their families and their friends intact. But Jesus wasn't just saying that you are a preserving agent and that you are a flavoring agent. He was saying something more. You see, following this declaration, both in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Sermon on the Plain, that declaration in the Greek of you are the salt of the earth is about six words, but then it follows up with this 20-word warning. And it says this. This translation is slightly different than the one on the screen. But it says, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. When I sat with Neil, I just asked the question, how can salt lose its saltiness? Because in so many commentaries that I've read, they said once sodium chloride, always sodium chloride. And Neil said, well, they've never worked in a salt mine. He said the way that salt loses its saltiness is be being diluted by other substances. And I said, that's really fascinating, but I'm still curious. What about this, this, this mention of the soil and the manure pile? Because I had studied this, bi- this passage and read it many times before, but I just never saw that detail. Well, it turns out that it is not just humans who can't survive without salt, but plants and vegetations need salt as well. Now, those of you who are gardeners know that if you go out into your flower bed or your lawn and you just dump a ton of salt and overpower it with salt, it it, it will cause things to die, and it's going to take a long time until that soil gets better and it can flourish again. But if you go out with just the right amount of salt, those plants, those flowers, that vegetation will thrive and flourish. It's why if you go down to the hardware store and you buy something like miracle Grow, you will discover that one of the top ingredients is a form of sodium chloride. It's why even today that one of the top exports of the Dead Sea is fertilizer, salt. And I understood that about the soil, but my question was about the manure or the dunghill. Why does, what does salt have to do with that? Well, we live in a ski area resort in... Park City, Utah, and we had a lot of snow. This last 
This last winter was like brutal. It was crazy. It set all records. But when the snow melted, um, we started to notice something. Because you see, Leif and I, we have a very cute pup by the name of Zoom. And here's a picture of him. He's a whopping four and a half pounds and feisty as ever. By the way, like never name your dog things that you don't want them to become, like Zoom or Rogue, you know, Biter, like just not, not a good idea. So Zoom has left his little deposits throughout the winter, and as the snow melts, we finally see them all everywhere. And what I begin to discover is that I will, I will go out with a little bit of salt and put it on those tiny dunghills, those little bit of manure. It will cause the manure to break down in such a way that all of the nutrients are preserved and that the manure does not actually rot so that the vegetation there can flourish. And so I bet when you came to Horizon today, you didn't know that you were going to get a science lesson, a history lesson, a Bible lesson, and a lesson on poop. But in Luke's gospel, those who heard understood that Jesus was not just talking about table salt. He was talking about fertilizer salt. And as the salt of the earth, you are not just a preserving agent and a flavoring agent. You are an agent of human flourishing. Wherever you go, you are called to foster new life, to help people grow into the fullness of all that Christ has for them. That where there is weakness, you bring strength. That where there is despair, you deliver hope. And where there is death, you speak life. That is who you are. And so in essence, when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he was saying, you are a preserving agent, you are a flavoring agent, and you are an agent of human flourishing. Now, the places that Christ often calls us will be stinky, difficult, messy, sometimes the very last places we want to go, the last people that we want to serve. But you know what? It's not just those words for salary and sausage and salad that have their root in the Latin word sal. The word for salvation is derived from the same Latin root as salt. It is your saltiness that brings salvation to a lost, hungry, hurting, and dying world. Some time ago, I met an incredible woman by the name of Susan. She told me about her son, who was just, just bragged on him for quite a while, and I listened. She described how he had started going to a church. And then one summer, he got a job with a construction crew, and he was out working, he was loving it, he was making good money, when in a freak accident, a large piece of equipment fell and hit him on the head. They rushed him to a hospital. Susan got there as fast as she could, and the doctors assured her everything was going to be okay. And five days later, he died. Susan said she was so stinking angry at God. She was furious. She described this day about six months after her son's death when she went into his bedroom. Nothing had been touched, nothing had moved, there was a thin layer of dust covering everything. And she went in that room and she just looked around, she just started to cry. And the tears came so heavy, she started to weep until she describes that she just fell down on the floor in such anger and such emotion, she couldn't contain it. And she says she took her fist and she just beat it on the carpet as long and as hard as she could. And she said, after she was exhausted, she had this sense that she had a decision to make. She could continue on the same path that she was on and become a bitter, furious, angry old woman. Or she could choose to become a follower of Jesus and ask him to do what there was no way to do on her own. She describes that she got off 
of that carpet that day, a different woman. She said, you know, I was so intrigued by that uniqueness of my son, that saltiness, the changes that I saw in his life, that I decided to go to the church where he was attending. Pretty soon, her husband decided that he was going to go to that church as well because he saw the change, the saltiness in her. And pretty soon, he gave his life, his heart to Jesus. He said, I want to be a follower of Jesus. But there was something inside of Susan who just had this sense that there was something more she needed to do. There was a sense that she needed to remain suspicious that maybe, just maybe, God was up to something good. And she got this idea. She says, you know what, I'm going to go through LifeLink, and I know it's blind writing, so I don't know who these are going to, but but I'm going to write every single piece, person who received a donation of the organ of my son. And so she sat and she wrote dozens and dozens of letters. Do you know that she only received one response? It was from the young man who had received her son's heart. He chose to write her back, and so they started exchanging letters. And then they began meeting in person, and Susan just just sharing her salty love of Jesus, just being who she is. Pretty soon, that young man started to go to church, and he decided to give his heart to Jesus too. I don't know how you give two or the same heart to Jesus twice, but he became a follower. And she shared this picture with me. This is a picture of her with that young man. I don't know what you see, but I see a mama who got to hear her son's heart beat again. What's good? What's bad? We don't always know at first glance, but we are a people who remain suspicious no matter what the pain, no matter what the loss, no matter what the horror, that our God is still up to something good. That gift of salvation, it's one of the most remarkable things that Christ offers us. Like, we don't have to do anything really for it. Like, it's a free gift. My Jewish father, years ago, he would have people come into a surf shop, and they would say, you know, they tried to tell him about Jesus, and he was just like, I don't know about that. And then, and then one day he read the entire New Testament, and, and he, he got done, and he thought, wow, you know, Jesus came to earth, he lived, he died, and he was resurrected that we might have salvation for free. And he thought, that is a good deal. And so he has been following Jesus for almost 60 years. And I share that because the gift of salvation is available to us all. We will simply approach Christ and say, I want to follow you with everything I've got. Forgive me, accept me, take me on a journey with you. And for those of you who maybe have already made that decision or are on that journey, I just want to challenge you. How are you living right now, this moment, this slice of history? Are you looking at the disruptions and the confusion and the infuriating things at times in our culture? And are you yelling out obscenities? Are you telling people to slow down, try to control their behavior? Or are you one who is rising up and saying, do you need help? How can I help? And coming alongside those people to serve and love with the grace that you have been given. My challenge for you today is simply to go forth as the salt of the earth. Amen. Oh
I'd like to thank everyone for being with us today. Thanks for coming in. If you'd like to connect, you can stop at the third door on the left at the hearth room on the way out. Thanks to uh, Margaret for coming here and sharing with us today. Uh, you can get a copy of her new book, Taste and See, at the table on the way out. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.